This episode of the Course Grind Podcast has been brought to you by Central Sports and Graphics Incorporated, family-owned and operated screen printing and embroidery business located in a historic storefront on Old Berwick Road in the heart of SB. They've been doing screen printing for over 20 years. They have high-quality product at a low price. Be sure to check them out. Central Sports and Graphics Incorporated, 570-784-1212. Now, on to the show. Hi, this is Chef Adrian Cheatham of Sunday Best Pop-Up Series in New York, and you are listening to the Sean Rossler on the Course Grind Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Episode number 112 of the Course Grind Podcast. With you, as always, host creator Sean Rossler with my sexy bedroom smoky voice. How the hell is everyone doing this evening? You know, true to my absolutely addictive personality. Now, listen, I'm not saying I'm addictive or like you get addicted to me. I'm saying, uh, all right, whatever. Anyway, I'm back to my old ways and running up my tab with Top Chef Talent again this evening. What's even better? I'm keeping it on the East Coast, the Beast Coast, with a proud Jersey chef who showed up Jersey strong on season 16. And listen, if you're going to get sent off, have it done by someone like Jonathan Waxman. Anyway, I digress. Tonight's guest has cooked with world-class chefs, including Bobby Flay, Anthony Bucco, and Michael White, and sharpening his skills in world-class kitchens, such as 11 Madison Park, no big deal, and two-star Michelin restaurant Via Hoya in Portugal. He's received distinguished recognition as the executive chef at the Kitchen at Grove Station, receiving three stars from the New York Times, who described his dishes as, quote, magical and hypnotizing, which is what I like to think I'm described as in the bedroom, but anyway. At Heirloom Kitchen, tonight's guest continues to impress, receiving three and a half stars from the Star Ledger within weeks of joining the team. He's even been nominated for a James Beard Award, Best Chef in the Mid-Atlantic, in 2018. Deservedly so if you watched any of his stylings on Top Chef. But we're here to learn about the early days, what formed him, what shaped him to be such a successful chef, and really what the hell made him be a Giants fan. Relax, people, I'm a Steelers fan. Neither of us have much to brag about this season. Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between, tonight's guest, Top Chef Season 16, chef testant and executive chef partner of Heirloom Kitchen, Chef David Viana. David, how are we doing this evening, buddy? Doing wonderful. So glad to be here, man. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Giants, Steelers, you know, we might have gotten the win this week, but it's like, well, what the hell are either of us doing? It's kind of like Bizarro I NFL. Wanna, I, I don't want to hear it from you as a Steelers fan. You've been blessed with so many great teams. Every oh. year you're in the playoffs. Like, this has been cool episode number 112 year. of the Course Grand <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. We do have six rings. I don't know if you mentioned that, but uh, I you know. know. Yeah, we do. But anyway, yeah, hey, listen. I mean, it's not six, that's for sure. Football's not our forte. Food is. So let's get rolling into it, Chef. Thanks again for joining us this evening, folks. New to the program, folks with shitty short-term memories like yours truly. Starters, mains, and afters. Starters, we're going to talk about where the guest in question came from. What brought them to be such a culinary force in the world? Mains, we're going to talk about where they're at. And afters, a little bit more irreverent, a little bit more off the cuff, but no one has been injured in 111 episodes. So without further ado, Chef David Viana, talk to me about where and what you grew up eating. So I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, um, son of a Portuguese immigrant. Um, So my Earliest memories are all around the table, surrounded by family and friends. My grandmother was an amazing cook. Um, she was actually ran a restaurant in Portugal before she came to America. So, oh, wow. um, she's the kind of person that she'd make you breakfast, and before, she, as soon as she was done cleaning up the, the table and washing the dishes, she started making lunch. And then, by the time you're finished with lunch, she'd wash the dishes and start making dinner. And then, that's how she lived her life in the kitchen, basically. Um, I watched her cook chickens and skin rabbits. And um, if you were to go talk to a five-year-old me who was watching horrified as she's cooking a chicken in the kitchen, <laughs> uh, the last place I wanted to be was the kitchen. But 
the food was magical and delicious. And I guess, you know, <clears throat> all of our celebrating and all those memories on the table kind of laid the groundwork for me spending my life in the kitchen. All right. So listen, folks, if, if you're listening at home, single folks, if you're looking for a woman, you got to look for a Portuguese woman, apparently, because they <laughs> will skin rabbits. They will horrify you, but they will cook the best food humanly possible. Like, that's so great. Like, I, I, I seriously, my, my grandma was kind of the same way, but she more scared me with the way she drove and the way she wouldn't take the cigarette out of her mouth <laughs> when she complained. So, you know, I kind of romanticize your situation, Dave. Um, you know, so such a cool background, such a cool, like, backstory. Um, what kind of an eater would you say you were growing up? Like, were you picky? Were there things you wouldn't touch? Was, or were you pretty much universal? I was pretty picky. Um, a lot of my grandmother's food I would eat, and I would, it was one of those things where I purposely told my parents not to, not to let me know what I was eating, because mm. it was so good. And but when it came to my parents' food, they weren't so great at cooking, but um, they tried really hard. They cooked every night. They had a home-cooked meal, but I was very picky. There was only a handful of things that my parents made that I would eat. Um, when we were at, at grandma's, I didn't want to know. But just, just put it in front of me and I'll eat it. I don't want to know what it is because I don't want to not want to eat it. You didn't so, want to know. Um, what was what was one yeah, thing that, like, you found out and it kind of, like, pulled the curtain back on the wizard? What 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 was one <laughs> thing you couldn't touch? It, it's still my favorite um, Portuguese dish to, to date is feijoada. Uh, every culture has it. It's like a bean stew. Yep. Uh, and it's usually with a lot of offal and, and yep. what they call it cassoulet. Um, you know, almost every culture has a stew, um, that <clears throat> kind of has intestine and, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, heart and liver and all these different kind of opal in it. And, um, I would eat it before knowing what tripe was. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would eat it. And then it, it got to the point in my childhood where I wouldn't eat it anymore once I found out what it actually was. Uh, and to the, today I love it. So, um, yeah. but yeah, I kind of went in a cycle like that. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that's an important thing. And just to sidebar off of the whole historical perspective, I know that Heirloom Kitchen is both, you know, this, this, this restaurant and a cooking school. So let's go school. Let's go educator for a minute. Um, you know, t talk to me historically. Like I've done enough of these episodes now, five years worth for those of you keeping track. But, you know, Chef David Viana, while I have you here, why does every culture have dishes? representative of that whether it be you know cassoulet feijoada um i think what most culture most cuisine is peasant food right mm -hmm. um that's that's what countries are consistent of um everyday laymen peasants um classically historically um farmers had maybe two two goats two cows a couple of pigs a handful of chickens so when you slaughtered an animal you want to make sure that every bit of that animal gave you nourishment. Every bit of that animal found its way to the table yeah. in one way or another. So some of these classical dishes do have, you know, intestine or, you know, this feijoada is one way of getting all these things in a plate. And with the beans and, and, and spending hours over, this, over the stove to break this all down, it comes into melt into this one flavor that becomes beautiful and delicious um, mm -hmm. instead of individuals just trying to eat Intestine, you know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. um, the stew is a nice little vehicle to get a bunch of things in there that kind of pay homage to this animal that you raised and, and now is feeding and nourishing your family and, and to make it as delicious as you possibly can by slowly braising it over five, six hours. Yeah. Necessity, not only the mother of invention, but the mother of beauty. And listen, uh, future podcasters, podcasters who listen to the show, if you think I was going to have a Portuguese origin chef on and didn't practice my pronunciation of feijoada. You're sadly mistaken. Yeah, you nailed that. I practiced <laughs> that shit for me. You nailed it. I won't say hours, minutes, but I did practice it because, you know, being fluent in Spanish helps a little bit. But anyway, you know, because otherwise I say feijoada and, you know, that's not right. So anyway, um, nailed it. yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I'll pay you later. Um, so, you know, he, he, here's these foods that, you know, you came to love. Um, and obviously, skilled as you are, talented as you are, um, and I know you'll be humble about it, but I'm going to continue to say that, you know, I'm sure you've come to replicate dishes over time that meant a lot to you. 
Tell me about a dish that has either eluded you just because you can't recreate it or because it's just that sentimental that you don't want to recreate it. What dish meant like so much to you from your childhood? Um, that's hard because I think you always, when you first start cooking, it, it's all imitation, right? Like, mm, um, true. the most creative chef in the world, you know, didn't come out of the womb creating dishes. He, he started out by imitating dishes, right? And, you know, the whole process of learning is like imitating. So I think I always went right for my favorites. Right. And try to recreate them right out the bat. So nice. I don't know if there's anything I ever held so reverent that I didn't want to replicate. Um, and it was quite the opposite. There's things I love so much that you um, had to replicate it. I had to replicate yeah, it. Yeah. Otherwise I wouldn't be happy unless I tried. Yeah. Um, I think, I think a lot of that goes toward all the things I do. And, yeah. um, it all starts with the first obsession delight and then wanting to replicate that and the, the search to make it you know perfect every time for sure um i think i think the um the duck dish on our menu right now um <clears throat> first time i ever had duck was at um Balut, uh shout out danielle in the city mm. ship danielle Balut's flagship i had duck there for the first time in my life i was currently i was just out of culinary school and the first chef i worked for chef Neil. He's like, I don't pay you much, but once a year, you got to go to the big ones, one of the big ones, have a meal so you know what great food tastes like. You need to train your palate. It's just as important as your skill. You need to know what great food tastes like to replicate great food. I'm like, all right, it makes sense. I'm going to do that. Yeah, so I yeah. my penny. <laughs> I went to Danielle. I had this duck dish. I was like, I've never had duck before. It was amazing. I yeah. loved it. Immediately afterwards, I found a place in New Jersey that had duck. I'm like, I want this duck. I know what I'm having. My favorite thing, and it was awful. Yeah. So, so poorly done. Yep. And this, this, this pattern continued for four or five more times uh, at other similar Jersey restaurants that claimed to have duck, and it was so poorly done. Um, I was like, you know what? If I'm gonna have duck, I'm gonna have to make it myself. Apparently, because nobody else is gonna do I love it it. justice like Chef Danielle did. So, um, I set out to make the perfect duck breast. And uh, I'm proud to say we serve that every night at the restaurant. It's one of our staple dishes, um, this perfectly rendered duck breast. Oh. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where I needed to have it again in my life, and I just couldn't find them chasing the, the high, you know, couldn't find this beautiful protein that I experienced. And you know what? If you can't find it, just make it yourself. So you just so, did it. You just did it. You, it's so, yeah, so it, spot on. You know, and it took a lot of, took months of trial and error trying to figure out every detail, every how to perfect, how to replicate it over and over and over again. But, you know, that's, there, there in lies the craft. Of yeah. And, 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 and like, I, I mean, duck's not a very forgiving protein, is it? I mean, not a lot of people no. cook with it. Exactly. Now, a lot of people, it's hard to find for starters. And um, <clears throat> it's so, so poorly done so often. So many people don't, you know, it's, it, a lot of food is the addition of all the details. It's what makes something great. Yeah. And there's a lot of details in duck that you gotta, scoring the skin is so important. Yes. People like put two or three cuts into the skin and like think it's scored. I'm like, no, no, no. I score on a, you know, inch by inch basis. Like I put like maybe a hundred cuts of a knife to, you know, if yeah. you score properly, you need to, you need space for that fat to render out. I want it so to look like 12 skin. people are playing tic tac toe, god damn it. Exactly. <laughs> Not just like one tic tac toe board on the top of it, but yes. nothing. It's not really going to help the, the fat render out. So it's the addition of a whole bunch of little details for something to become extraordinary. And I feel that way about a lot of dishes and a lot of food. Yeah. Um, and duck is one of those things that people don't spend the time to really learn properly. Duck, duck is like, you know, anything truly meaningful. If it's done well, it's the greatest thing in the world. If it's done poorly, it'll scar you for life. True. I always <laughs> tell people they've never had duck before not to order mine because they'll be disappointed every time afterwards. They'll they'll be scarred for life <laughs> in the funny, best possible way. Say, I, like, I really, I was like, it comes with a disclaimer, if you've never had duck before, don't order this one because you'll be ordering duck for the rest of your life and you'll never get it. Okay. You'll have to come back here to get this. But listen, if you live around the tri-state area and, and you can drive to Heirloom Kitchen, get the goddamn duck and just keep going back. It's get fine. You'll be all right. <laughs> you'll be all right. You know, you bring up a really important point and it's, you know, I know we were kind of texting before the episode started. You know, then I had to lay my two older boys down. 
parenting and such. And uh, one of the parenting decisions my wife and I have made is to spend, you know, more money on experiences, less on the things. And we've really made it a focus on dining to be that that joining element as well. And so to hear you say that one of your, you know, way back, quote unquote, you know, execs told you to do that. That's so spot on because um, for my 40th birthday, my wife and I gloat on her for this. So this will be like the 100th episode people have heard this story. She planned basically a road trip from Buellton, California up to San Francisco. And as we were heading up the coast, we stopped off in a little place called uh, Napa. And uh, while we couldn't get into French Laundry, we got into Bouchon. And because of my quote unquote press credentials, we got in the back. I saw three Michelin stars hanging on the wall. I saw the sign, wow. the, the, the signatures on the wall from Danielle Balut, from Jacques Pepin, you know, all these greats. Wow. And I'm like, you will never replace this. Even though I had steak free. Like, listen, it, it was phenomenal. Do not get me wrong. But even that wasn't necessarily the high point. The atmosphere was the high point. You could feel it. You could smell it. And so... You know, just like yeah. that former leader of yours, just like my sweet wife did for me, I really hope people can tune into that. Like, if you've got the time, if you've got the money, what better reason to spend money on something than to put it into your body and to store it in your memory forever? I, I, and one parent to another, I think it's a beautiful gift you can give your children. If you can impart the, like, love of great food and wine to your children, it's a gift that they'll have for the rest of their lives. So they'll, they'll have culture, they'll appreciate yeah. other cultures, they'll appreciate so many much more things in life. If yes. you give them that background to appreciate food and wine. And um, if you can, if you're, that's what you're setting out to do with you and your family, I think it's a wonderful gift you're giving your kids, like right. the appreciation of culture and nice things and good food and getting to know people through their food is a wonderful way to get to know them. It was, how did, how did Bourdain put it? It was the greatest sociologic uh, movement. Like, the way that culinary took off, it was sociology. Like, he got to go yeah. out and experience these cultures, and it's it's the same thing. So, uh, honestly, at this point, fuck, we could hang up the mic, but, you know, we're, we're only a part of the way through this interview, sir. Um, safe to say, then, based on all of this wonderful culinary knowledge, which, I mean, it, it, if I ever need a co-host, I mean, you're it. You're getting the call up. Um, who was your greatest culinary influence growing up? Not that I kind of don't know that already, but I feel the need to verify. No, it was my grandmother, honestly. Yeah. Um, the things that she, that she would do in the kitchen, and like I said, at first horrified me. I, like, sometimes I'll catch a chuckle in the middle of service, and, like, I'll be, like, plucking a partridge, you know what I mean? And, like, I just, like, start chuckling to myself, and my staff, like, what is so funny? I'm like, and I'm just imagining my three-year-old self watching me like plucking a bird in front of them and like horrified, like, how did you do? Like, what are you doing? Like, you know, um, yeah. but so many of the things that she did, uh, in the kitchen to this day, um, they're like life, lifelong memories. And, um, I think her, like knowing that I did, I was a very picky eater, but with her food, there, there was something special about what she did and what she contemplated yeah. that I was willing to put all that stuff aside. Um, those are the memories. Um, that was the influence I think that yeah. lasted the longest well that's a straight up ratatouille memory and, and i i always reference things like this because there's moments where the food hits you and, and like you have to be of a like mindset and obviously if i started the talk show five years ago and it's still running i've got some wires crossed that make me of this mindset and there will be times that i taste certain things and my wife will look across at me and my eyes will well up and, like, it'll be something that I've had before and it meant something to me. I might not even be able to place it at that point in time. And so, like, you plucking that partridge. Um, my wife, here, I'll throw my wife under the bus. There was a watermelon uh, water ice she had when she was with her grandma, like, when she was, like, six, right? And took her to a local establishment, which, if you're ever in Pennsylvania, uh, Old Tioga Farm. Um, they only serve okay. Friday, Saturday, prefix. Um, it, it is 100% farm to plate, brilliant, beautiful, inspired, and they did a watermelon sorbet. And I swear to God, you could have framed it frame for frame with when the food critic takes the bite of ratatouille. And she <laughs> leaned down and she touched it to her mouth and she looked up at me and she was welled up. And I'm like, that right there is everything I ever want in food. 
trigger a memory, yeah. give me a childhood sensation of, you know, a better time, a more innocent time when I relied on someone else. And, it, you know, isn't that in a way what dining out is? It's about relying on someone else to fulfill your basic biologic need. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, it's relying on a bunch of um, strangers to make you feel at home, to cater to you, to, um, to, you know, maybe disappear so that you can have that in the evening and be on the periphery and, like, just kind of be there, like, right when you need them and no, no other time. Or, or it can be, like, someone there to give you some company and a little bit of fellowship with your meal and tell the right joke and, and, and do that. And, um, I think I pride myself in being a very hospitable chef and, always wanting that the evening that they spend at their own to be perfect. And yeah. whatever that form that takes for you, I, I have an open kitchen, so I'm always dealing with the public and our, our guests. And, and <clears throat> I want the experience to be what you want it to be. So yeah. there, sometimes, with, by the way they look at me, they want me to engage and to be, you know, you know, talk about Top Chef or, or give them what, and, and that's what I'm there to do. I, yeah. Or sometimes I can tell they just want to have a sit in an evening and just, watch the show and I can disappear too. Like I want it to be the best version of the Heirloom Kitchen that you imagined. Yeah. I want to meet and exceed those expectations and it comes in different forms. And that's what we're providing, right? Relying on all these people to want to take care of them. And that's, that's the big key to, to have your staff believe and have them motivated to want to take care of them. It's not good enough that you, they do. They have to want to do it. They have to wake up that day and choose that those guests are going to be important to them and, and they're going to do that, their best. And if they come in with that want, that's all I can ask for as a chef. God, I was I was gonna crack some kind of sarcastic line here, but I can't even fucking bring myself to do it. Listen, if you're in culinary <laughs> school right now, and I know there's a lot of culinary students that check out the show, I want you to go back. I want you to replay those four minutes. I want you to record those four minutes and set your alarm to it and lay in bed and listen to that every morning. And when you believe it, that's when you can graduate. Holy shit! I mean, that's it, it's it's heavy to a beautiful degree, and it's it, it's absolutely right. You know, food is cradle to grave. It, it's it's everything everybody needs, and to rely on a stranger to do it, you're spot on, dude. You're you're relying on not only the biologic need to be fed, but the emotional surroundings of it. And yeah. what a great perspective to take on that. So all of this considered, though, so, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, from from grandma beating the shit out of a rabbit to, you know, all these other things, you know, here you are today, the professional that you are. But what was the moment? What was the striking of the match that made you go? Oh, this is my life. What happened? Um, I don't know. I think um, <clears throat> I, I think I got into food because I liked following directions and. Um, I think, I think ultimately I like making people smile, like by making them a great sandwich or, or like, there's like really primal in the wanting that satisfaction of making someone happy for that moment, like watching that smile on that bite. You know, there's like, when you're doing it for your, when you're in your dorm room and you made, I made the best sandwiches in the dorm room. So like late night I make grilled cheeses and everyone would line up with grilled cheeses and just like seeing everyone be so happy about that. I wouldn't even decide, I hadn't even decided to be a chef yet. I was going to school for criminal justice. I graduated with a criminal justice degree. So, but that satisfaction I wasn't getting in my daily life yeah. um, as a probation officer. And there was yeah. no moment like that. And I was like really selfishly after like that moment. And I liked the, the structure of cooking. I liked the structure of the kitchen. I, I, I liked, you know, the day to day. So that's when I decided I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to spend my life in the kitchen, and then I just kind of became obsessive about it. And yeah. at that moment where I, like, just, just couldn't read enough things and couldn't eat enough food. And um, now you're, I'm a much more balanced your day. I'm not so obsessive, but um, I'm also much better at my job because I was at one point. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, you know, better to be obsessive, like, up front than later on, because then you're obsessive over, like, bad habits versus obsessive over good. So, yeah, you know, and... and, and that people pleaser facet, you know, I've I've brought up on air a couple times. You know, my my forays into it. I'm not completely unaware. I can hold my own in the kitchen. Um, you know, worked with uh, Grill Bitch from Kitchen Confidential. Um, guest chef an cool. event with her. I cooked uh, 
cooked and plated 312 for uh, uh, this charity event local. It, it, it's not like I can't, you know, hang. At the end of it, it's never about, you know, the dollar sign. It's about the smiles. And, like, when I see people come back in the kitchen and, like, grinning ear to ear, there's no better. That That's that's like the comedian saying the laugh is the drug. Well, I think the smile is almost a drug, too, right? A hundred percent. I'm literally cooking in front of people every night. Like, our, our stove is right. On the, across from the guest, where the guests sit. So I don't even have my back to them. It's like the line is behind me. So right. I have my back to the guests. Like I literally facing the guests all night and I, I spend my nights watching people take their first bite. And I, I know when someone doesn't enjoy something because I know the difference with that, that satisfying first bite versus the, huh, I don't know. And I'm like, uh oh. Like yeah, I yeah. need to send this person something else. Like I need to win the mover. I want every person to have that satisfying first bite, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, that's... Like a, that's a yeah. I people, literally spend yeah. my days watching people eat, like a little perv. Yeah. <laughs> people, and people I can't don't... imagine going back behind the wall and not doing it in front of people anymore. Like, I'm literally working my dream job. I don't want to be behind the wall anymore. I, I get so much more satisfaction watching people eat. Yeah, no, because so then funny. you have to rely on FOH to bring you feedback, and you know that's getting skewed sometimes. You know they're not bringing you the Absolutely. real story. So like no, Absolutely. I I I would want to see that, but you know, sh- shout out to the f- fucking Yelp White Knights. Um, you know, listen to the human heart that's behind this. Okay, the next time you want to whip out your phone and be a little cowboy and go pew pew at like someone's <laughs> heart and soul, dude, just go walk into traffic. I I don't even care at this point if I'm vilified for trashing Yelp. I did it online the other day. I'll do it again. The, there's value to it, there's merit to it, but, like, before you react, it's like the people that, you know, tweet or Facebook, oh, tweet, you mean our president? Um, you know, these random, just hate-fueled shit without thinking, like, stop for a minute. This is someone's livelihood. This is someone's lifeblood. And you're gonna do it just cause, you know, you got one little crispy bit in your whatever, like, it, it bugs me. Uh, it bugs me to no end. My favorite, my favorite when they preface their review is, I've gone there a dozen times. It's always perfect, but this one time it wasn't. Now I'm oh. you know, writing about it. I'm like, so the guy went one for twelve. Like you know, it was eleven for twelve on good meals, and the yeah. one time you mess it up, you're gonna go yeah. right to the Yelp and give him three stars or two stars or whatever it may be. And and yeah, yeah I get it. You're only as good as your last meal, and I want every meal to be perfect every time you go. But yeah. that one, like, that one little kind of, like, oh, I've been here for years. It's always been amazing. Like, this one time, what yeah. happened? I'm like, yeah. so shouldn't that be forgiven for all the years worth of meals Dude. you kind of talked about? Dude. Like, shouldn't this one incident kind of go get swept under the rug for old time's sake, you know? Like, Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> you, po- you, posture um, up li- you posture up like that, and this is a shout-out to every Yelp cowboy out there. You posture up like that, then I better not hear you bitch. When they get their stuff in line enough that they have three Michelin stars on the wall and you're paying $500 for the night. Once that's in yeah. place, don't you dare complain because you made it so. Yeah. If you want it to be that uniform, great. French laundry's, you know, open. Yeah. Go fly no, over if you like it. Otherwise, deal with human imperfection. Wow. All right, Dave, you're not doing wonders for my blood pressure. I'm not going to lie. Uh, boy. <laughs> So let's talk about something a little more people centric. And I know that for you, um, Heirloom Kitchen as exec chef and partner isn't just about the restaurant. It's about both the cooking school and the mental health awareness behind it. And I know we were discussing a little bit beforehand how meaningful that is to me, you know, being close to Grill Bitch, you know, about Bourdain and all that. And, you know, the cooking school, being an educator myself, both marry up to what I'm doing. So talk to us a little bit about just what Heirloom Kitchen is and does. So Heirloom Kitchen is a cooking school and restaurant. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we operate as a cooking school only. We offer one public cooking class a night, each night with a different theme, Monday through Wednesday. And then we're only open as a restaurant offering um, dinner service. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we're a seven-day operation, but essentially, through those days, we have 14 
16 people in our space, in our kitchen, cooking, chopping, learning, you know, five different recipes, you know, things from date night pasta to vegan dinner, vegan classes to, um, you know, cabal free drink, steak night, um, whatever. Uh, there's hundreds of Thanksgiving dinner, um, make your own Thanksgiving there. Um, so, um, we offer really eclectic cooking classes each night has five different recipes and but what it really does is it keeps my team small and it kind of really I wanted to prove that less is more in the restaurant industry. Um mm-hmm. owners sometimes want to open lunch and dinner seven days a week or breakfast, lunch and dinner. Like the more shifts you have, the more money I'm gonna make and that makes sense for them. And, um I'm coming from a completely different perspective. I wanted to perfect the nights we open as a restaurant and have every single person on the team there in their station Nobody else making their prep, like there's accountability for those four nights. And then the other three nights when we're cooking school, you know, everyone is off the whole, there's no hostesses, bus, bu- bus boys, there's no back waiters, there's no managers, it's two people from the kitchen teaching 14 people soulful cuisine and, and they're learning from chefs with scars on their arms because they work on the line every night and they're passionate and they're not like retired you know, chefs that kind of just want to pay jobs. You know, yeah. learning from passionate chefs to work around every night, me included, and my sous chef and my pastry chef were all teaching me classes. And what it does is four nights you're in a restaurant in the world, and the other three nights you're either off or you're in a very laid back day. There's, you walk in sometime in the afternoon, and you can take the whole day off of that. As long as you're ready for class, it takes a couple hours to set up the trays and organize yourself for, for the students. And uh, it, it really does provide much more balanced lifestyle for everyone involved in our restaurant. And it comes from the less is more. And it's actually been much more profitable than any restaurant that I've ever been a part of because um, we're open, we're never closed, and we're always generating revenue, and we're doing it in a very smart way. So so as as the podcast host, I have to clue everybody in. Anytime I do the backstory, I always feel the need to ask up front, like, hey, are you still with – because – traditionally there's a lot of movement a lot of volatility with restaurant placement when chef told me about this movement like my jaw kind of dropped because you know up front i'm like what wait it's it's part cooking school part restaurant but as soon as you drop those days of the week what a beautiful business model it is it's it's so brilliant and it's just such a it's so much better than i i came up with like idea happened with me and my partner. She was running a cooking school and asked me to teach her. And I wasn't willing to give up my craft yet and it was politely declined. And between the two of us wanting to work together, we came up with this idea and it was like penicillin. And it was just like so amazing. And and you just talked about the movement and you asked me if I was still at my restaurant. I said, of course. And um, I still have employees who are open three years. My entire team have never left. I have the same stuff. Jesus Christ. Are you serious? Restaurants. Yeah, my team is still there, grinding away. Every like We enjoy working together. We have the balance of our lives that we need. They work at the 50-hour work week, and they're doing, you know, the, you know high-caliber food and food that we're passionate about, and, and no one ever leaves because it's a really great place to work, and we put a lot of energy into making sure that they're happy. And the balance is there that they need for chefs. It's really hard to find a place that cares about what you need and provides you with both the motivation to be great at what you do and the, you know, balance of having respect for the life you want to have outside the job. So, um, we put a lot of energy into making sure that everyone's happy. I couldn't pay enough for a video feed on my face right now when you said <laughs> your entire team is still there. Like, that's like yeah, a given. Yeah. Like, you don't get to hang around with the same people for like a month. Like typically it's like two weeks. Oh man, I, yeah. What? No, it's, it's real. And it's like, it's become like cheers. Like we have an open kitchen. So my pastry chef is my expediter and I work the line every night and, and people come in like, Hey, what's up, Sean? Hi, Kat. Hi, Dave. I was, I was, you know, they know us personally because if you go to the restaurant long enough, you talk to us long enough, you kind of know it. You take the class with us during the week and then they'll come in for dinner a couple times a month and, you just become like it's become like cheers in there, like where everyone knows your name. It's like oh, God. they want they kind of depend on the characters that we've kind of become of ourselves. I don't want to say like this is the perfect business model, but I will go on record as saying this is the perfect business model. So there you go. 
you have it. Um, so within oh, this I, business really model, sure. Mr. Fancy Pants, chef, teacher, godsend apparently in the culinary industry, um, you know, talk to me. So obviously for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you've got to have a menu on deck. And I imagine mm -hmm. that menu changes periodically, if not frequently. Where are you drawing that from? You know, how do you serve those masses who apparently there's a lot of return customers. How do you keep them happy? W what do you go to? Sure. So we, we change nothing is sacred except for the duck and the duck breast alone is sacred in the, in, in the breast, but the accompaniments change seasonally. So it changes pretty regularly. Um, but the duck breast always stays. So that's the only thing that really we give any kind of reverence to. Um, aside from that, everything and anything is up for grabs. We change two dishes every single week. So I find that it's much more seasonal to do two dishes every single week. Um, I call what we do in the kitchen like a dance. And again, mind you, we're in front of everyone. So we have to look like we know what we're doing. So <clears throat> we're dancing. You right? should try being a podcast host, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're communicating, we're, 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 we're not verbally eye contact, like hand signals. We say two words, but we actually said a lot more because we've danced together on a nightly basis for months now, right? Gotcha. Whenever they would change the whole menu, right, it'd be like, oh, you've been waltzing for three weeks, we're going to rumba tonight. It's all rumba tonight. You know, you, you haven't rumba yet, but it's all dancing, right? You can rumba, right? We're going to change the whole menu. So no one's steps are the same. And I always felt like it sacrificed at least two full weeks of services before a restaurant got back into that groove where they were dancing, right? And I always thought to myself, when I own my own place, I'm never going to do that. Like, that just seems like it's too much. Where if I change one or two dishes every week, truly in the spring, not everything comes up out of the ground at the same time. A couple right. things come in the first couple weeks, and then a couple more come the week after that, and then a couple more come the week after that. Why don't I change it? just as organically as it comes out of the ground, that's when I'll put that thing on the menu. Um, and that way I'll change two dishes every week. And it's like adding a turn or a dip on the third, on the third go round, you know, and we're still dancing and it's easy to remember one or two dishes that change as opposed to the entire menu. If people are thinking, they're not acting or reacting or dancing. They're just thinking about what, what goes in this again? Oh, we just learned it yesterday. Oh, or I would, I'm, I'm I would work an entire night of service when you change the menu and forgot an ingredient on a, a dish the entire night, you know, and I'm, and I'm proud of myself of being a great line cook and wanting to do things perfectly. And I would forget a whole component of a dish just because it was the first time I did it and I just forgot, you know, and it was really careless. But those are the things that happen when you change the entire menu as opposed to one or two dishes. Yeah. So, so, all right, everybody, if you're listening, I should probably stop doing the show after this episode because apparently I've met Mr. Perfect here. Um, not only do they have the perfect business model, but the perfect approach to a menu, which, uh, again, like, if you don't hear it before tonight, and you hear it now, you go, why didn't I think of that? It's so logical. Yeah. It's painfully logical. So, like, why do people continue to do that? Yeah, I don't know. Like, oh, you know, twice a year we change the menu. I mean, because that's what their, that's what their chefs taught them, and a lot of what we've done is just hearsay or, or just, um, you know, we're, why, you know, why do kids act the way they act? Because they watch their parents in their lives, right? And you want, you want your kid to read? Don't tell them. Pick up a book while he's sitting in the room and let him watch and read and he'll start reading, you know? And, uh, we, we are future what we watch and what we experience and there, there just haven't been enough people to think outside the box. And that's what I encourage all my young chefs to do is like, think outside the box, question everything, think nothing is fact, you know? think is there a better way to do something and you'll more often than not likely come stumble upon a better way to do something. If you are not making that a shirt for Heirloom Kitchen, take nothing as fact, <laughs> you would sell the shit out of that shirt. I feel like I've been merchandising like so many guests lately. I'm telling you, take I, nothing as I'm, fact. I'm gonna take nothing as fact that's gonna be on the hat. Oh that's, that's happening. That's Heirloom perfect. Kitchen. That's awesome. I'd buy it. I'd order it. It'd be awesome. Um so, I mean, there you go, people. Listen to somebody who has not only lived it, but has, I, I would say, nearly perfected it. It makes sense. If he's held on to the staff for this long, and it's making this much sense, and it's feeling like cheers, something is going right there. So, give a listen there. 
Um, so across these changes, these two changes every week um, or so, talk to me about what your greatest creation on that menu has been, aside from the duck. I'm going to throw that caveat in. I don't typically do that, but I feel like you go for the duck immediately. <laughs> no, you're right. Um, when have I done that? <clears throat> it's pretty special. Um, well, it's really funny. The, the dish I was really in love with over the last thing that I just recently took off was the chicken marsala. And it sounds like really funny, but one, it was one of those few dishes that my mom made as a kid that I really did like. I told you that they weren't like the best cooks in the world, but mm-hmm. my mom's chicken marsala was like really, really something I enjoyed as a kid. And I went back and visited my parents recently and like she made chicken marsala and I was having a couple bites. I'm like, man, this is so good. And, like, Reminded me of my childhood, that, that smile, that rather chewy smile that you talked about. Yep. And then yep. I said to myself, I wish I could put this on the menu. You know, but chicken rice sounds like the ultimate wedding food. It's like, <laughs> uh, just like the thought of putting it on my menu just made like no sense, right? And I immediately rejected it. I was like, no way I'm putting it on. It's fair. That's fair. Then, <laughs> right? And then as the day went on, I'm like, well, if I was going to put it on the menu, what would be the perfect mushroom, right? Like, what would be the ideal perfect mushroom for both? Texture and so, and then I thought, well, I was thinking if I had these beautiful chickens that I'm getting from Pennsylvania, like those would be like the perfect bird for chicken my song. And then you know, as you're working over the course of two weeks, I slowly built the perfect chicken my salad dish, and I made these like beautiful rice grits from whole grain rice, and, uh, and broke them down and cooked them like grits and made a uh, gluten free rice grits, and like I came up with this whole dish in my head. <laughs> And I put it on the menu and I loved it. Uh, like absolutely, it hit that craveable kind of sensation that reminded me of my mom that she made like just a few weeks before. And it was perfect and like beautifully executed and beautifully plated and, like, it would, like it deserved and always belonged in this restaurant. And I didn't feel that way when I was eating it at my mom's house, but through the course of two weeks, I slowly made a punch list of the perfect circle my salad, how it would look. And, um, making that and bringing that to life in the kid in the restaurant it was like really satisfying. I love it. I love it. And, and it's, it's never perfection out of the gate. I think so many people who, you know, I don't have a cooking school. What I have is a big fucking kitchen. And when guests come over and they're like, Oh, I've never used a chef knife before or something like that. I will literally in the middle of a party break out a carrot or a stalk of celery or an onion and be like, come here. We're going to do this. We're going to do this right now. You know, it, it, it's an evolutionary process. And if you haven't cooked before, folks who folks who are new to cooking in general, you're not going to nail it right out of the gate. Folks who are established, you know damn well, the recipe doesn't perfect itself in a day, in a week, in a month sometimes. It takes mm-hmm. time. Yeah. No, for sure. And and the recipe doesn't tell you what pot to use and or what yep. skillet to you grab out of your out of your, you know, drawer or like there's so many little details in the environment of your kitchen specifically. Like you know, I know that my left oven is a hotter oven and it just runs like ten degrees hotter than the other oven. And I know that the top right burner is the most is the hottest burner. And there's so many little details about my kitchen that I know personally and that I'll make one dish specifically on that one burner because it sears better. Or, you know, there's so many like a great chef is mindful of those details and all they what made me good at to start with me my superstition, wanting it to be perfect again if I nailed something. So I go and run get to work early and grab the same pot because I want to make sure like I was superstitious and but, mm-hmm. you know, the, the height of the pot makes a difference sometimes or the, the width of the pot of rondeau makes a difference, you know. Yep. Because you get more surface area. Like, there's all these details that you might not be aware of just now. So, be superstitious as a home cook, yes. and you'll find that you'll get better results and you'll be better at what you do. Because there's a lot of little details that you're missing because you're not really aware of them, but they're they do add up. Yeah. To your dish getting better and better. Yeah. Ca- cast iron is your best friend. That's one of my superstitions in the kitchen. Whenever you can use it, do so, um, folks. Yeah. You know, old, old vets of the show know. In sixth grade, um, my mom got me for Christmas a cast iron skillet and pancake mix set for Christmas. And I still have that motherfucker today. And I, I baby that. It is in pristine shape. I will sear. I, you bring me Kobe, you smuggle Kobe beef in your ass from Japan. I'm going to put it on that cast iron. 
because it is there that precious. Like, I will trust that with my life. Um, it, it's the only pan I trust implicitly. And there's so no reason. Which one of your boys are going to, which one of the children is going to leave a character? Like, that's a big deal, man. People leave their cast irons in their well. You don't need, you don't need to put that pressure on me yeah. right now, Dave. Knock it off. <laughs> um, you know what? It depends on the day of the week. You know, you got to put that in the will somewhere. It depends on the day of the week which one's my favorite. It changes, so. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, anyway, um, so that, that's, again, I think, you know, culinary students who listen to the show, home cooks who listen to the show, you know, hearing that creative mindset behind the process, it's so key. Like, it's not unattainable. Like, you watch this on TV, you think, there's no way in hell I could do it. Um, you can, you have to embrace the ability to realize it's not an overnight thing. And once you practice it, and once you know it, that's going to be when somebody else asks you, how'd you do it? And you'd be like, oh, it's easy. And they'll look at you and go, ain't no way I can ever do that. And the process begins again. I, I always tell people, I was never very uh, creative. Like I said, I, I like cooking because I like following directions. I never thought I'd be a creative chef. And people always assume, like, oh, you must be like, you must have been the most creative kid. You were like, like no, I, I, I wasn't. Like, my art teacher took away my paint class and told me I should watch because I was so bad. Like, I was not creative and I was not artistic. I think all of that happened with a saturation of knowledge. I became obsessive over food. And once, like, you get so much knowledge, your brain starts making connections that aren't on the page. And yeah. that's what I call the creative effect. But it came because I was in, inundated with so much knowledge. Like, it, it takes a long time to know, you know, have the knowledge of your hands and your craft and have the knowledge of food in your brain. And when those two kind of get to this one level, all of a sudden, that's when the creativity. So you can, you can give yourself creativity. Just learn and, and treat this profession with the reverence it deserves and read books and practice and, and take every stroke oh. of the knife as an opportunity to practice yep. the stroke, you know? Yep. Take every stroke of the knife seriously, right? Don't waste the stroke. You're absolutely every time right. you pick up your knife, it's an opportunity to work on your knife skills. And if you treat this profession that way, you'll be surprised at how creative and talented you can become. Read, it, it read. from a lot of work. Yeah, read every book. You, you spoke it right there. And I'll tell you, I don't know about your kitchen. I can imagine, you know, our kitchen is an absolute library. When I went over to uh, Beth's house, uh, Grill Bitch, like her place was a fucking library. You know, I think you know how serious people take it when you see their book stash or what's going on. Well, when people come to the restaurant and the table's not ready, you put them in the cookbook nook. It's this little corner of the restaurant where all of our cookbooks are. It's like, yeah, it's like a little mini library. All, all right, I'm 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 checking out how far it is tonight. I'm checking out how far it is tonight. We're gonna get a babysitter. It's a three hour drive over, three hour drive back. We'll figure we're just gonna park the kids with a babysitter the entire day. There you go, problem yeah, solved. I'd love to take care of you. Please. Oh my god, I would be in heaven as I'm sure my wife would. Um, more to come on that because believe me, if we make that trip, we're gonna live cast it the whole day. So anyway, let's talk about. You know, here you are in the industry, you have created so many great things, you've created this establishment that nurtures not only, you know, stomach, soul, mind, it's it's incredible. Obviously, in your position, you see a lot of trends go and a lot of trends come. What, in your opinion, is the next big food trend that's on its way to hit or going to hit? Or eventually going to hit? Like, what's what's next in the queue? Um, I mean, I, I had a couple of amazing meals. Um, I think right now. Um, so it, it's funny. So this is a trend that kind of Tom Colicchio started with craft. Right, craft was like simplicity on a plate. Right, it was like you yep. pick a main, you pick a side, and we're just going to execute the crap out of it. Um, I feel like all the fun on dining establishments today are riding that wave of simplicity. Um, I ate at Angler in San Francisco recently and it was a mind-blowing meal because everything looked like it was barely touched by the sauce and then you, the potato was actually put back together with thousand baby slices and they like remade the potato to look like a potato but it was already like sliced a thousand times and, and 
put back together. And I'm like, so it looks like a potato, but it's much more than a potato. I'm like, holy crap, like, how much, how much skilled laborers are back there putting potatoes back together after you slice them. And then they like, probably put some, from what I could tell, clarified foam between every layer and then, like, roasted it that way, like, yeah. whole, after it's already been sliced and put, you know, clarified butter in between every slice. So it was, like, insane. So I think the, the, the trend is simplicity, but um, I don't know. Uh, that's 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 what I'm seeing at the really, really high level, and I always get really jealous when the chef can make something that looks so simple but kind of is elevated in a lot of different ways. Yeah. But it looks simple, and I think that's the new, the new magic trick is making everything look like it's, oh, it's just a slice, you know, just a bit of roasted potato, and when you break into it, it's so much more. When it hits your mouth, yeah, of, yeah. So simplicity... Almost, almost reverse engineered simplicity, if you will. Yes, reverse engineered simplicity is the best way to put it. There we go. There's another shirt for you, Dave. Um, so, <laughs> look at looking at trends because we know how annoying they can be. Talk to me about one trend you would like to see get pushed off the top of a 50-story building. <laughs> I mean, I guess I, I'm tired of farm table. The, the notion, especially when you walk into a place that claims to be farmer table and you know they're not, like it, it's there become it such there a, it is. a thing to say that, that people don't actually follow through with and it's, you know, for a chef and you can obviously tell them the place is not by what they're putting on the plate and um, that's really unnerving when the, the, the fakeness of the farmer table it, it, yeah. it becomes such a, a trend that people can just say it and People that don't know it will believe it, and, yeah. and there's no accountability for it. There should be a farm to table police policing yeah. the farm to table movement or the farm to table claimers. Well, that's kind of like the like whole a, percentage a of whole grapes system. with a wine title. Like a certain percent yeah. has to be a Cabernet Sauvignon grape to be called a Cabernet Sauvignon. You should be subject to the same percentage rates. Same scrutiny. Yeah. Exactly. There totally should be more great. scrutiny with the farm to table claim. And if there was, then I'd be. I wouldn't care. I mean, it wouldn't be a problem. But I, my problem is, I think a lot of people are just saying it to say it, and and when the product comes out, there's no way that this was a farm table trick, and there's no way that this this product is. They don't come this size when they're farm table. No, no, no. Four pound no. birds is a commodity bird. I can tell yeah. the difference. Like, so those are the things that are frustrating. Yeah, it's not really not to easy to claim and never follow through. Yeah. Not to blow up the local scene even more, but Dave, if you ever make it over to Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, specifically, the Blind Pig Kitchen, Toby and Sarah uh, Walser, they have a farm. I like the name, Blind Pig Kitchen. Oh my God, dude. You have to check it out. I'll, uh, I'll either text you the, the, the link to them later or yeah, some, somehow I'll get please. it to you. But this is literally <laughs> one of my favorite stories to tell is, so Toby is this big dude. Like, he's not small. He's a farmer dude. He's the kindest, sweetest guy you'll ever meet. But you can tell he'll off an animal in a second to get what he wants from it, right? <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, we, we go there all the time. They were they were on the show in the 20s. They've done great. They bought their building. They were, they, they were live guests at the 100th show. Phenomenal friends of the show. And so I feel the need to blow them up. Everything they put on their plate is from a local farm, and they have farmers meetings in the restaurants. They have farm featured farmers nights where it's only stuff from their farms. Like it's incredible. My favorite story to tell: if you're looking to get a stamp of authenticity from a farm to table, if this hasn't happened to you, you might want to question it. I'm sitting there minding my own business, right? And so we had ordered a dinner, whatever, and out comes Toby, and he hands me this. Uh, it was it was a crostini with what appeared to be like a, a mousse or a pate on top, and he goes, "I'd like you to have this. This pig was very dear to me. I slaughtered him this morning. Enjoy," and walked away. And I'm like, "All right, I got two choices. I enjoy this shit, or I'm in the next terrine. Like, what is gonna yeah, happen yeah. to me?" But but again, you know, I try it, and it tastes like the earth. It tastes like the beauty, the authenticity. The just the it tastes like the ground it was made on, and if you're not getting that, I agree with you. 
you know, I, I hesitate because I know there's people who've been on the show who are like, yeah, we're farm to table. Technically, so is everybody. So shut up. Unless you're doing it to that degree, I don't think you should wear that badge. Exactly. Yeah. Heard. Heard. So what's next for you, man? Like, you know, here you have Heirloom Kitchen doing great restaurant things, great cooking school things. Um, it, as uh, Executive Culinary Outfitters was just on the show, their goal is, you know, chef mental health awareness. You know, clearly you have it there, too. You have this great thing going on. What's next? What's the five-year plan for Dave Viana, for the Heirloom Kitchen? Um, well, I guess we're currently looking at a space in Philadelphia. We're looking to expand Heirloom Kitchen to Pennsylvania, actually. So, so I, mean, love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> I love you. Uh, we're looking to open up. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes with the second location, we're like, oh, we're going to go bigger, we're going to go better, we're going to have this, we're going to have that. And I just want to recreate the exact same thing. Same yep. seats, same counter, um, same everything. We're going to same model, cooking school and restaurant. And um, it's at the point where, like I said, I've had the team for three years. And, um, you know, I've been blessed that the business has grown every year and given raises. And, and But they're at the point where half of them need promotions and need more responsibility. And, uh, heirloom Kitchen is so big, and I'm there every day, and um, I need to take this talent that I've kind of fostered and nurtured and that they've had themselves this whole time, and I've been lucky enough to have them in my space, and if I want to keep them, and I have to promote them and find another space and yeah. grow with them and give them more responsibilities and opportunities to get better at what they do, and that's what we're at right now, and we're, we're very close to uh, starting a project in Philly, so... Uh, that's what we're focused on, and, and I think that Philly is a great market for this, and I'm excited to, to be a part of a, a bigger pond, so to speak. you got to pick up Eddie Conrad. He's our Philly brother of the show. <laughs> Your boy, Eddie That's Conrad. Boy. Yeah, give him a glass of water. You see a water, and, water. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Water. That's right. And uh, <laughs> you know what, Ashley, speaking of Philly, you've got a dinner coming up with Nick Elmy, right? I do, I do. Uh, Nick Elmy, uh, a friend from Philly, my boy Eddie Conrad, worked with uh, Nick Elmy for 10 years, and Elmy was winner of Top Chef Season 11, and has the best restaurant that I've eaten at in Philadelphia, Laurel, and um, we're very blessed to have him come in with his cookbook, and his sign some cookbooks for some guests, and we do a special six-course tasting dinner with Nick Elmy coming, coming up in a couple of weeks. Nice. So what's... what? What should people expect if they show up to that? Um, well, we have this beautiful open kitchen, so uh, you will be able to interact with Chef Nico Salmi, who is quite handsome in person. Oh, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you get to you'll know, get to talk to Nico, so he's going to sign cookbooks for you. Everyone gets a complimentary signed cookbook from from us uh, and signed by Nicholas, and um, you just get to share some time in the kitchen, watch us do our magic. Uh, eat amazing dishes prepared by Nick and, and my team and uh, just a wonderful night. I love watching other chefs in our space um, because it is a little shocking how close you are to the guests and how much time, how much face time you get with guests in our space. And I always get a kick out of like the slight hint of fear in their eyes and they see people sitting down right in front of them for the first, you know, five minutes and then slowly watch that turn into like pretty cool and and ultimately happiness and, 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 and like enjoying the experience. So um, yeah. I see that whole process happen right in front of my eyes for the first time whenever anyone comes in our kitchen. I get a little bit of a kick out of it, actually. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, again, Chef Nick Elmy from Season 11 is going to be uh, representing in the Heirloom Kitchen. Uh, top Chef winner, man. Top, I'm winner sorry. Winner. Top Chef <laughs> winner. We don't, we don't get hung up here <laughs> on winners. We're like the A. The, the Course Grind podcast is like the AYSO of Top Chef. Everybody wins. Oh, so I, I get my medal in the mail. You this. get your medal in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I love it. That's going to be great. Um, you know, again, stunning, stunning Nick Elmy. That's how you should, you should like, put a poster up like I a know. wrestling promotion. Stunning Nick Elmy. Yeah. He would be like the ravishing Rick Rude of the top chef circuit. Did you just Philly. drop Rick Rude on my... God damn it. Well, we, need wrestling, right? we need to hang out. We need to hang out. All right. <laughs> So that's awesome. And again, you know, the Philly space, everything coming up. Obviously, you have so much good fortune, good luck, and good skill behind you. 
you know, there's nothing but greatness in your future. Speaking of greatness in your future, we've come to the afters. We've come to the questions that are way off the cuff, way out of bounds. But again, no one's sustained a serious bodily injury in 111 episodes. So maybe that won't happen tonight. Brian told me he sprained his ankle from one of your questions. Who told you that? I don't know if you can. Brian Young? He said he sprained his ankle from one of your questions. Listen, you you uh, tell Brian Young to get me the damn shirt picture. We'll talk about a sprained ankle. (laughs) You talk. Don't you dare. Don't you dare name drop. All right. So without further ado, Brian, if you hurt your ankle, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I apologize. All right. Moving forward. I'm standing in your kitchen, and you can pick professionally or at home. That's totally your option. What music do I hear? Now, with an open kitchen, I imagine you'll go for home on this one. Yeah. Um, Childish Gambino. Nice. Uh, you get a little childish. Um, I like Kendrick Lamar, and then, um, yeah, I'm a little childish Gambino right now. I'm really feeling childish. Love it. Love it. Um... You're going to be stranded on a deserted island, and you can only bring three foods or food-type items with you. Inexhaustible supplies through the magic of podcast magic, um, but only three. What would they be and why? Three food items. Um, um, So I can have, like, a lifetime supply of bacon, so to speak? Absolutely. Bacon's one. Bacon? Because, like, you can make a bacon bread. I need some kind of bread. So I can have a field bacon bread sandwich. Okay, so bread. I have to make, I have to be able to make a sandwich in Portuguese. I can't have a meal without bread. My dad actually would use bread as like a knife to get stuff onto his fork. Nice. Um, so I think the Portuguese roll has Portuguese to be in that, in that care package. Specifically, if I was going to go buy a type of bread. Portuguese roll. I love the bacon. fact that you named a specific type of bread. That's so ballsy. I adore it. <laughs> and then lastly, um, I'm going to go with condiment. I like something to go. I'm gonna do bread and butter pickle. So I'm gonna be able to eat wonderful bread and butter pickle bacon sandwich for the rest of my days. I'm gonna be good. Damn, that's solid. That's a that's a big commitment, but that's a solid commitment. I'm not gonna lie. That uh, I I stand in awe of that choice, Chef. Well done. Well played. Um, I I can even make like a bacon bread pudding at some point. At some point. Uh, yes. Listen to this guy. Maybe there's coconuts on the island. Coconut bread pudding. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. A little coconut milk, make a little bread, and a little bread pudding with the bacon in there. I don't know. We'll see. You're hooked up. You're <laughs> I got hooked a lot of time up. in my hands on this island. I'll, I'll figure something that's out. That's right. Plenty of time to sit and menu make. Um, so have you checked out Melanie Denea's My Last Supper? I've not, unfortunately. You've Is not. You okay. So Melanie Denea, famous photographer, did. First coffee table book, My Last Supper, and then a follow-up, The Next Course. Each book was 50 world-class chefs with the same questions asked of them. I'll admit, I took the inspiration from her format to create this show. It's, you know, it's kind of a brilliant, cool format. And her questions all centered around, your ticket is getting punched tomorrow. What's your last meal? What's your last drink? Who's there? What music is playing? And so, Chef David Viana. Tell me about your last meal. Um, <clears throat> my last meal is going to be a spicy sausage bolognese. Oh. Um, uh, I, there's something so comforting um, about that to me. It's just like I will happily go on a full stomach of that and, and be ready for, for what comes next. Yeah. Um, as far as who's at my table, all right. Um, I want Justin Timberlake there just because he can strike things and he seems like a pretty cool cat. Um, and I would just like to spend some time hearing about his life stories. It's like, I think he's just like a cool dude. Wow. Um, and he's on, he's on my list. I want Anthony Bourdain. I want him back from the dead. Yep. Uh, I feel cheated that I never got his seat at the table at my table and we're going to make that happen. But, um, I think he's an advocate for what we've done for, for our lives, and there'll be nobody that'll put Dude. such a poetic voice to what we do like 1, he did. And it's going to be it's going to be a hundred years before anyone quite like that. And then lastly, Jose Andres. I think he has gone beyond being a chef. Um, he feeds the world. He feeds knowledge. He's an advocate. He is a spirit animal for chefs everywhere, and I think we should all be equally proud of him. And uh, I would break bread with that man any day. One thousand percent. 
You know, and, and, and like, isn't it so symbolic, too, that Bourdain and he were so tight? Like, yeah. God damn. Yeah. I mean, good people, I, you know, good people, you know, are running packs, you know, like, you know, you, I, I feel like it's okay to judge a person by the friends they keep, you know, and, yeah. and that's a, it's a, it's a good way of, you know, way to be and helps you choose your friends and, and be wise about who you, who you keep in your circle and, yeah. and in life, it's a good thing, so. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not surprised. I think they're both kind-hearted human beings that are advocates and, and, and they're special people. Yeah, yeah, they get to hang with me. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and you know what? I, I, I'll be honest, and it's probably been about the past 30 episodes. I've had more Top Chef uh, alumni, you know, say to me, yo, I talked to so-and-so or yo, I listened to your episode. And like, I could tell I wanted to do the show. And that's been the greatest sincere flattery of my life. Like, to know that, like, you know, I'm standing behind it as a cause, much like Heirloom Kitchen is standing behind it as a cause, you know, this isn't just about food and it never was and I don't think it ever will be and, I'm, you know, it's it's so much deeper than that and, you know, much much like you, Bourdain, Bourdain was my hundredth and, uh, you know, he got ripped away from me mid-80s and it's yeah. like I, I thought about hanging it up right after that and I talked to Beth, I wow. talked to Grill Bitch, the guy that socked the guy in the balls in the kitchen. And she's like, don't you dare. Don't you dare hang up the mic. And I'm like, all right. Well, if I'm going to take right, orders from know, anybody, it'll be from you. <laughs> Anthony would want you to, man. And, and, and it, all you, Anthony would want nothing more than for people to talk about food and talk about chefs for the rest of their lives. Like, that's what he's left his life doing. And I don't think that he want anything more than for you to keep following your passion and keep putting our voices out in the world and letting people talk about what they're most passionate about. I think it's all beautiful thing. Yeah. So, well, you, I appreciate you are, that, man. You are exactly where you are right there, man. I appreciate that. And I, you know, pray to God every night that that's true. But without further ado, Chef David Viana, the final question, the shortest question, the most complex question, what is food to you in one single word? Uh, I'm sorry, what was that again? <laughs> what is, what, what is, is food, food to you? See, he's buying time. He heard oh, me, God damn it. What is food to you <laughs> in a single word? Uh, friendship. Ooh, love that. Haven't heard that in a while. That's nice. Can you expand on that? Sure. Um, it goes, it's, it's, we're, through humanity, where bonds are made is over, over the fire, over food. Um, it's nourishment. It's where people get to know one another. It's where we spend our time is around food since we were cavemen, you know, so. Yep. Um, it's friendship. Yep. And, and. and there's nothing that says, mm -hmm friendship more than handing someone something to eat to you know like there's so much symbolism about friendship it's, it's, like it, it can go so many ways yep and hey listen if you're a walking dead fan you know damn well what happened this past week with someone handing negan a piece of freshly killed boar i think it was there you go nothing's better than mm -hmm. friendship through food so man dave i really Really appreciate it. I'm so glad we connected. So glad that we could talk about what Heirloom Kitchen is doing for not just the culinary front, but the mental health front in the culinary profession uh, and beyond. And uh, listen, if nobody else tells you this this week, you are truly doing God's work uh, where you're at. And I, for one, appreciate the shit out of it. Thank you very much, man. I really appreciate that. Oh, um, likewise. I really do. Thank you. Yeah, man. Uh, thank it was you. a pleasure talking, man. It's been fun. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation. And, um, definitely come by. When, if, if I'm in Philly and you don't come by, then it'd be a real tragedy. Listen, yeah. I, I work... I can understand you don't want to go to Moonbridge, but you better go to Philly. Listen, okay. So <laughs> so full, full disclosure, I live in Central PA, but I work for an organization based out of, basically just outside of Philly. So I go down there every once in a while. You can bet your ass 10 ways to Sunday. First of all, when you announced that opening i will be promoting the living shit out of that and when i do that you will see my ugly mug showing up at your front door Perfect. going can you That's give me a I seat have. can you give me a seat <laughs> That's all I want. It's <laughs> the Thank people you. pleaser till the end <laughs> ladies and gentlemen this has been episode number 112 of the course garden podcast with me this evening chef david viana of heirloom kitchen both partner and executive chef 
Uh, be sure to check them out at heirloomkitchen.com. And if you're going in person, 3853 Route 516, Old Bridge, New Jersey, 08857. 732-727-9444 for reservations and information. Remember, they've got cooking school Monday to Wednesday and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for the restaurant. Again, you don't want to miss this. Coming up soon, dinner with the ravishing Nick Elmy. There you go. I just peppered that a little bit in there. And that'll work. That's going to take. Be sure to check him out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Be sure to check Dave out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. Um, you really don't want to miss what they're doing. They're doing incredibly important things in an industry that has looked the other way for far too long. So again, I can't appreciate it enough. Our producer this evening has been the Reverend Johnny Lamoria, Johnny Lee Robinson. Be sure to check out the cinematic pig's feet riding again soon. Stay tuned to that. And our next episode of the Court Grind Podcast, we're going to be giving something back to your sweet tooth. You won't want to miss it. Hey, do you like coffee? Do you like gourmet coffee? Do you like really amazing gourmet coffee that's a total steal and just happens to be based on a culinary podcast? Well, look no further. The Course Grind Podcast has teamed up with the Mr. G Coffee Company to create the perfect custom blend. Dark is the logo itself with hints of caramel, sea salt, and dark chocolate. It is luxury in a cup at an incredible price. Be sure to check out their site today, mrgcoffee.com, and order some now.